And we're going to continue our great program now with Dr. David Irwin, who is one of the directors, one of the co-directors of the Cure PSP Center of Care at Penn, and he's going to be talking about research and biomarkers and brain donation. So thanks for being here, Dr. Irwin. Sure. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you to Cure PSP for having me today, and thank you to all for, for coming. It really is a uh, a treat, an important part of my work to be able to come and share with patients what we learn from research. Uh, all the work that patients go through to do research uh, with us, it's important that we're able to dispense that information back to you. And uh, what I'll be sharing will hopefully um, help inspire that we are learning a lot and we just can't learn fast enough. So. Um, I lead the FTD Center at Penn, that's at HUP. It works closely with Dr. Dake and his team because PSP, cortical basal syndrome, um, MSA can have various features. And I'm a cognitive neurologist and I was trained in cognition but also in neuropathology and helping understand the biology of the disease. So kind of the outline of what we'll talk about is to start with nomenclature and the terms because it can be very confusing. And many patients, I'm sure many of you have gone through the um, experience of having different diagnoses and having diagnoses change. And then we'll talk about two different types of research. One is called observational research. That's research that's done to collect data, samples, information about the disease. Um, and the goal of all of that is to help us get the tools so that clinical trials or therapeutic trials, which is the other part of research that uh, we'll be talking about at the end, that are testing an intervention or testing um, a medication or some other intervention to help with disease. And these talk to each other. There's a strong interplay between the two. And I'll give some examples of that. So, um, you know, one of the most confusing issues, I think, is the terminology that we use. And as a neurologist, I was trained with terms that um, that you all are aware of a progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, multiple system atrophy, frontotemporal dementia, but neuropathologists, uh, doctors who look at the brain under the microscope and perform the final diagnosis of many of these neurodegenerative conditions have a completely different system of nomenclature or language that they use, slightly different terms. And what can be even more confusing is that PSP, cortical basal syndrome, um, often can be grouped together with other cognitive impairment problems like FTD or frontotemporal dementia that can involve behavior or language. Uh, not all PSP and CBS patients get those features. Some of them have much more motor features, which then they're more likely to be grouped with uh, multiple system atrophy or dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's or atypical Parkinsonian disorders. And the neuropathologists have different terms for this characterized by the proteins that accumulate in the brain. All of us have these proteins that are under normal situations, healthy, uh, and doing different functions in the brain. But these are different photomicrographs or examples of, um, of uh, what the pathology looks like under the microscope. And they're different. And the functions of these proteins are very different. And the treatments will likely be very different to stop the accumulation of these proteins. So the goal is to start to break down um, the difference between the two different specialties. So we're all speaking the same language. And one of the ways that we could do this is with something called biomarkers. This could be any type of test uh, that helps us tell about the biology or what's happening microscopically in the brain when we see a patient. And a, a good analogy to this is cancer research, which uh, has an advantage over neurology because uh, if you have a tumor in the lung or the liver or some other organ, it's fairly straightforward to get a piece of tissue non-invasively, go to the microscope and say, this is the type of tumor this is, and then this is the type of treatment. With the brain, we're not quite there yet, but we are getting very close, and there's lots to be optimistic about. I don't want to go through all the details of the different um, diagnostic criteria, but I just want to line up for you the spectrum of FTD, the different disorders, and how the names have changed over time. And one of the things that stands out, so on the left we have all the clinical diagnoses that we consider part of the spectrum of frontotemporal degeneration. And on the uh, right are all the different pathologies that neuropathologists find associated with these syndromes and the different terms that they use, slightly different. Frontotemporal low bar degeneration is what the pathologists use. And they see two different types of proteins, either TDP43 or the protein tau and these different morphologies. 
And one thing that stands out is that progressive supranuclear palsy is one of the few clinical syndromes that's kept its name over the years, whereas several others have changed. So many of you may have heard the term Pick's disease. Pick's disease was one of the earliest um, forms of originally in the 1800s was primary progressive aphasia, but it's been used in clinics to refer to patients who have more language or behavior changes, primary progressive aphasia, behavioral variant FTD. Now we know that Pick's disease or these clinical syndromes could be caused by any one of these other pathologies. But when someone meets the full clinical criteria of progressive supranuclear palsy, they're about 90% or more likely to have progressive supranuclear palsy tau. That's why that has kept its name. It's a clinico-pathological term. But, as we'll show in the next slide or two, uh, PSP tau can show up with any of these different syndromes. So it's specific, if, but it's not sensitive, and that affects our ability to treat. Cortical basal syndrome, now we call it cortical basal syndrome because it could be caused by cortical basal degeneration or the specific form of tau that under a microscope is very similar to PSP, but also could be caused by these different forms of TDP43 or sometimes even Alzheimer's, plaques and tangles. So all of this is very complicated. Uh, and this, what this schematic shows, these are just color coded by what the doctors use as clinical diagnoses in these boxes and the colors show the relative frequency of the pathologies, tau, pathology of tau protein in red, blue is TDP43, and yellow is Alzheimer's. So you could see PSP and motor syndromes of ALS are uh, pretty strongly predictive of a specific pathology, whereas our cognitive syndromes are more mixed and we have more difficulty. Uh, this slide illustrates this phenomenon that PSP tau, or what the neuropathologists calls, call PSP, can present not only with what we think of the classic Richardson syndrome or the PSP clinical syndrome, but also these other FTD-like syndromes, including cortical basal syndrome, um, a certain type of primary progressive aphasia that has non-fluent speech and trouble with grammatical comprehension and expression, and sometimes even behavioral features. And some of these patients that have more cognitive presentations don't always get the motor features of the eye findings of PSP that we think of as classic for PSP. So we need to do a better job of detecting PSP in living patients. That's why I collaborate so closely with Dr. Dake and his team because PSP could present both in a cognitive or in a, a movement disorder uh, presentation. Uh, not to complicate things further, but it's important to acknowledge that multiple system atrophy is an important uh, atypical Parkinsonian disorder that could look very similar to PSP and cortical basal syndrome, as can Parkinson's disease. And again, we don't need to go through all the specifics of the syndromes, but pathologically, they're very different. Multiple system atrophy has alpha synuclein, a different protein. It's mostly in white matter, as you could see here, the connections of the brain. And we can detect this on an MRI sometimes uh, where we could see atrophy of the brainstem, but could be very hard sometimes to tell apart from a patient who has symptoms of PSP. Same thing with Parkinson's disease. Um, recently, in 2017, uh, PSP criteria were updated, and uh, the purpose of this was try, try to give doctors and healthcare professionals the tools to be more um, accurate in diagnosing PSP. And what's illustrated here is the four core features of the classic PSP syndrome that we think of, oculomotor dysmotility, postural instability, akinesia, or slowness of movement and, and balance difficulties, as well as cognitive impairments, both behavioral and language. And the way this is designed is there's different levels of certainty. When we see the classic supranuclear gaze palsy, that has a higher weight than some subtle eye findings that may be an early feature of PSP. And this gives doctors different frameworks. If we have someone who has probable PSP, that means we're highly likely that there's tau pathology in the brain, where if it's possible PSP, that means that there may be underlying PSP, and that could help us with an early diagnosis. So we have different diagnostic categories to help researchers, uh, clinicians, uh, for different aspects of care and, uh, and research of PSP. So why do we care so much about all of this? I think an analogy that, that may be helpful to think of protein aggregation 
pop-up ad. So we've all had the unfortunate event where we've clicked on the wrong thing by accident and it sent a cascade of ads that's taken up our entire screen and we can't stop the cascade from aggregating on our screen and our computer slows down in certain respects. And uh, that's very similar to these proteins that for reasons that aren't entirely clear why this happens in some individuals and not others, these proteins can stick together and cause uh, neuronal dysfunction and clinical symptoms. And here you could see the main categories of proteins that accumulate across the spectrum of FTD and atypical Parkinsonian disorders and the different syndromes that they cause. So if we could detect these proteins during life, then we can look at the mechanisms that are involved with their function, develop therapies, and hopefully slow or stop the progression of the disease or even prevent if we can detect it early enough. And that's a major emphasis of translational research and observational research. Um, I do want to make a brief note about nomenclature. So I'm part of an NIH working group um, that got together to help give clinicians, researchers, a com and patients a common language because of all of this complexity. And the main, uh, these recommendations will be probably coming out in the next year or so, but uh, the main approach that's going to be proposed is that we keep our clinical diagnoses, it's important, PSP, cortical basal syndrome, they help tell us about what the patient's experiencing. But we can add to this as we get more biomarkers or tests that tell us about tau, alpha-synuclein, TDP43, we can enhance these diagnoses so that it's biologically meaningful, the same way that uh, cancer when they have biopsy uh, materials. So now I want to move on to start to talk about observational research and some of the work we do at the Penn FTD Center. Uh, we have several NIH-funded studies that collect blood, spinal fluid, uh, imaging of different resolution and type, both PET scans as well as MRIs, uh, different types of cognitive testing, including recordings of speech that help us tell a lot about how the brain is functioning. Um, we also collaborate with an ophthalmologist who does eye tests that tell us about the retina, which is an important part of the brain, and can tell us about PSP. And all of this is so important because it helps us get the tools that could be implemented in a clinical trial as an outcome measure to measure an effect to tell us if a therapy is working or not. Um, some examples of the work that we've done. This is Gabor Kovacs, who's a neuropathologist in Toronto who spent time at Penn uh, with us looking at hundreds of brains with PSP. And when we look at them under the microscope at different regions, this is a heat map. It tells us the relative onset and timing of where we think tau starts to accumulate in the brain and may spread to the brain. If we look at patient brains, Tau isn't distributed in a random fashion. It seems to follow a very stereotypic pattern where people who have more advanced disease, we might see tau spread into the temporal lobe or the occipital lobe. These have different symptoms. Uh, for example, language is important in the temporal lobe and um, understanding words. And usually that's not a symptom that we see in PSP. The tau that we see in PSP under the microscope is invisible in clinic to us. We don't have the imaging modalities yet to see it. So this type of post-mortem work and looking at brain tissue is so important because as this technology is developed, we have this data from the human brain to really guide us in, on the biology and how this disease may spread so that that could be measured in a treatment trial as an outcome. Um, this is work done from my lab, so I have a lab that we look at brain tissue and help us understand what we see in living patients. So this is Dan Ohm, who's a, a postdoc, a trainee in the lab, and we looked at the locus ceruleus as a small nucleus in the ba uh, base of the brain. And the way the brain is set up is that we have small collections of neurons that bathe the brain in neurotransmitters. And disease in these uh, small collections of neurons may help inform us about uh, what types of symptomatic therapies could be helpful and help us you know, better identify the disease. So we know that Alzheimer's disease that also has tau affects the locus ceruleus, but it's not been studied in PSP very carefully or other forms of FTD. Um, so what we did was look under the microscope in a large group of about 200 patient brain samples, and you could see this is a PSP brain sample that has tau proteins accumulating in this brain uh, cells in the locus ceruleus, whereas TDP43, uh, we rarely see any pathology. And when we actually measured the degeneration of those cells using an image analysis tool, we found that 
PSP and related tauopathies like CBD had uh, much higher loss of these cells compared to patients who look very similar that had the different protein. And this seemed to relate to different clinical features as well. So suggesting that uh, perhaps uh, neuroepinephrine uh, boosting therapies could be helpful in these patients. And, um, Detecting this nucleus during life might help us uh, with diagnosis as well. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about imaging, but also it's important to uh, look at fluids and blood tests. A blood test would be non-invasive and very promising uh, in PSP, CBD research. And this is uh, Catherine Cousins, who is a... Um, uh, biofluid specialist at the FTD Center, we looked at um, blood tests that are being developed, looking at proteins that are in the brain, not tau itself, but something called glial fibrillary associated protein that's associated with the glial cells. These are support cells that often accumulate tau, and something called neurofilament, which makes up the connections of brain cells. And when we looked at uh, patients where we had brain tissue and we knew what their diagnosis was, we found that looking at a ratio of these blood tests could help us d diagnose PSP and related tau diseases from patients who had no neurodegenerative disease, as well as those who had the TDP43 protein. And then we looked into patients who were living who had met the full probable PSP criteria and are highly likely to have tau had a much different level than TDP 43. So getting a blood test into clinic still takes a lot of work. This is very preliminary, but important first step in developing um, these kind of markers that could help us in trials. And having brain tissue and brain donation is critical for us to develop these new tests. Um, this is Ben Kim, who's, a neuro op who's an ophthalmologist who works closely with us doing OCT. This is non-invasive imaging of the retina. And there are connections of the brain to the retina. And he finds that thinning in a uh, layer of the retina seems to be fairly specific to PSP patients and actually relates to some degree of motor functioning. It might be a non-invasive test that could help us in a clinical trial. And in a few patients who participated in brain and eye donation, we were able to validate those findings and uh, the measurements of the retina both post-mortem in the thickness of the retina, as well as uh, the diagnosis of confirming that tau is present. So another example of the importance of brain donation. And then uh, finally, in my lab, working closely with my colleagues in radiology, we take brain tissue, whole hemispheres, and put them in a high-resolution MRI. And we can do this for several hours. That gives us microscopic resolution. And what you see here is a PSP patient brain in the motor cortex, an area that when we looked at all the different histology slides had more tau pathology. And you can see that there's these dark uh, black areas that related to iron and glial cells, those support cells. And this was a very different signature than we saw in patients who had TDP43 or even Lewy bodies, which I don't show here. So uh, very uh, promising that we could look right at the tissue and confirm our observations on the MRI. And this is a seven Tesla MRI that's FDA approved in living patients. It's the same scanner that we scan living patients with. And we're adapting these sequences where we have the brain that could stay in the MRI for hours to 15 minutes in a focal area that we can measure and detect this pathology in a living patient. So this is all ongoing and very exciting. And then finally, I just want to uh, end with some information about um, therapeutic trials. So all the research I showed you is trying to get more information about the disease, trying to look at tissue and develop new tests, and then this would be how to implement interventions to slow and stop the disease. And this schematic is complicated. The main idea here is to just illustrate that the process in PSP and related disorders of having a healthy protein that starts to aggregate, stick together, and we think it may even spread from cell to cell to cause progression of the disease, gives us many opportunities to intervene and to stop the process. Uh, and what's new is that uh, there may even be a role of tau and uh, gene expression, and uh, there are certain a clinical trial ongoing now looking at stopping this process as well. So we know the target. We're starting to be able to get the tools to detect the target as early as possible, and now we can start to test interventions. Um, so um, 
here I just wanted to highlight, this was a clinical trial that we participated in a few years ago for immunotherapy. This is using passive immunotherapy, meaning an infusion of antibodies or specialized proteins that are specific for tau pathology. Uh, and the goal is to, with that, to go through and block that propagation of the tau protein from spreading from cell to cell. And unfortunately, that trial didn't meet its endpoints of patients getting clinically better to a level that was measurable and, and reproducible. But uh, in collaboration with uh, Eddie Lee, who's a neuropathologist at Penn, we had brain donation from several participants who were in that trial. And um, while tau pathology of the tau protein was still abnormally aggregated there, he noticed several distinctions in the pattern of the pathology that was different than patients who didn't have that treatment that were in the brain bank. And that's illustrated here. He saw that tau was in astrocytes that were in a different morphology that had activation of something called the lysosome, which is the part of the cell that breaks up tau. Uh, this is a suggestive, not clearly definitive, but suggestive that there was what we call target engagement, meaning that the intervention was affecting the biology of tau. Uh, it just wasn't successful in reaching clinical endpoints and clearing it completely from the brain. And, and I put here on the bottom uh, an example of a parallel. This is somewhat similar to what was observed over 20 years ago in Alzheimer's disease research, where the first immunotherapy for amyloid beta, the plaque protein in Alzheimer's disease, um, didn't meet its clinical endpoints. There were issues with that trial. But in the first brain uh, autopsy studies, you could see that there was some evidence that there was less plaque in the brain of a patient who was in the trial compared to someone who was not exposed to immunotherapies. And then fast forward to 2021, despite some of the uh, controversy, there was an FDA-approved medicine uh, for Alzheimer's disease that, um, you know, with a newer agent. So um, we can't have developments fast enough, um, but there is uh, evidence that the process that is going on in research is making important developments and that working towards those disease-modifying therapies, the therapies that can affect the biology of PSP to slow and stop the process are on the horizon. And brain donation is really a critical piece to all of that. <clears throat> So I want to end just to highlight some of the trials that we have here. Um, this is my colleague Roy Hamilton, who's a cognitive neurologist who does a lot of work with stroke aphasia, patients who have a stroke in the language part of the brain and have difficulty finding their words. Uh, there's something called transcranial direct stimulation. This is non-invasive. It's small stickers to the scalp that's illustrated here. And this is a heat map of where a small amount of current gets applied to the brain. And in patients who have stroke, there's a good amount of data that you can stimulate the brain non-invasively and help the healthy parts compensate and help with word finding. So not all PSP patients or CBD patients have problems with language, but many do, and they would be potentially eligible for uh, this trial, and it's, uh, he originally did an open-label trial, meaning everyone got a, uh, a stimulation, patients knew it, doctor knew it, uh, and it was encouraging, but the next step is to do it blinded, so his trial is set up where there's two arms, and in one arm a patient gets a sham, meaning the machine isn't turned on, and in the other it is, so everyone is their own control, and everyone gets uh, a stimulation, so that's something that we have available. We also have gene therapy, and um, uh, immune therapies for a specific hereditary form of the behavioral variant and language variants of FTD with progranulin. Usually patients with progranulin don't present with PSP-related uh, symptoms, but sometimes they can present with a corticobasal syndrome. Um, I didn't talk about genetics, but that's something always to consider if any concern about genetics, uh, to consult with a genetic counselor and support with your doctor. Um, <clears throat> for that. Um, we did just have a, a phase two study for PSP looking at a, an oral agent that helps um, with this uh, issue of tau affecting gene tra transcription that's closed to enrollment, but there are other tau-directed therapies on the horizon coming at Penn and elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of interest in this area and um, a lot developing. So um, just to summarize, I think that you know, advances in nomenclature help communicate symptoms and biologies 
to patients, uh, to other healthcare providers, to researchers. We all have to speak the same language and, and help be more precise about what uh, patients are experiencing so that we can ultimately treat them. Um, improvements to diagnostic criteria have been developed and are ongoing and being validated to help us detect not only um, those who are most likely to have PSP tau, but also pick up the most subtle signs that uh, PSP and related tauopathies are occurring in the setting of cognitive disorders. So having good collaboration across cognitive and movement disorder groups is really important and getting comprehensive care like we heard earlier. Uh, observational research is important to help us develop new tests or biomarkers. Those are the tools that we need to make a trial successful and brain donation is such a critical piece of that. And then finally, therapeutic trials in PSP are ongoing and in development in an area that um, you know, can't develop fast enough. And we are seeing some preliminary evidence for some target engagement, which is promising. So um, everybody in the lab works really hard. They do leave the lab sometimes to celebrate uh, the Phillies before uh, as they went to the playoffs. And I really want to make a special thank you to patients and families who participate in our research, uh, how much uh, we really appreciate and how it's critical to help us uh, work towards treatment. So thank you. Oh, it's stuck in my ear. Thank you so much, Dr. Irwin. I mean, such promising and important research that you're doing, and thank you for sharing that with us. We'll take, I mean, as we've been doing, a couple of questions, and then we're actually going to have a full panel with everyone who you've heard so far today. So there'll be, again, more opportunities. But any questions for Dr. Irwin? I do see a hand in the back. Oscar, if you could bring the microphone over there. Um, I have a couple questions. One, um, you mentioned this idea of it could be when you find early signs preventable, like that there could be certain types of things that could help with prevention. Could you speak a little bit more to that? Sure. Um, we think that microscopically, <coughs> although we don't know definitively, but excuse me, microscopically, the proteins start to accumulate probably at least years, if not decades, before the patients develop symptoms. So if we could find what we call prodromal symptoms, or these very early subtle signs that PSP, CBD, MSA are starting, that gives us the window to potentially intervene. Uh, it's a gross generalization, but in general, we think that a disease-modifying therapy would have the highest likelihood of success as early as possible before the degenerative process um, was more advanced. Is there something out there right now, or is it just the idea of it is possible? There are no, I'm not aware of a prevention trial for PSP, but the criteria that were revised in, in uh, 2017 are an important step towards that as developing these very, um, what's called uh, possible or uh, oligo PSP, just subtle signs of the earliest that helps us establish what PSP would look like in the earliest stages. And then as we learn more, those could be refined and biomarkers or tests could be added to help develop. So for example, and a patient on the cognitive side of things has mild cognitive impairment. If we were to see subtle features of ocular motility or other features that could suggest PSP, that would be the time that we would want to try to intervene and enroll in a trial, potentially. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, we know that there are a lot of psychotropic medications that affect the tau protein, like benzodiazepines, for example. And I'm curious if there have been any like cross-sectional studies around how we use like long-term use of different psychotropic medications that affect the tau protein could be like, a fact, like if that's something that could have either predicted it or caused it. Sure, that's a great question and a complicated one. There's a lot about the biology of tau that we don't understand. There are some what we call preclinical data. It's hard to study tau um, in the way of the human brain or that's reflective of the human brain. So sometimes there's data that suggests that a certain drug may interact with tau. It's hard to establish that in a human. We don't, we're not aware of any particular medical intervention or drug that could precipitate PSP in a living patient, but there are medications that could exacerbate symptoms of PSPs, and benzodiazepines are one that 
potentially could worsen balance symptoms, cognitive symptoms, have rebound phenomenon. So in general, the approach of a multidisciplinary team for the treatment of PSP is to identify the symptoms and use the lowest dose of symptomatic medicines to help, especially when it comes to things like sleep, restlessness, or agitation, if that helps answer the question. Yeah, I think my big question is just simply, have we looked at all the PSP patients and looked at like, what medications they were on throughout their life to figure out if there was something that could have caused it, since there seems to be no real clear cause. And it's just this random protein that shows up and just goes over and over again. I'm just curious if there's been any kind of like way to say, oh wow, a lot of these patients have been on X medication, or a lot of these patients have been through X experience that has caused this. So I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a great point. So epidemiology studies are really important to give us those clues of what are the exposures or lifetime experiences that could have precipitated PSP and why some people get the disease and some don't. It's been a challenge because the diagnosis has been a challenge. So with the new diagnostic criteria, for example, that helps epidemiologists to look in more detail and identify these, um, there are certain issues with recall bias, so head trauma, for example, has links to PSP and other forms of neurodegenerative disease and good preclinical data, um, but also uh, establishing those links definitively is tough because there is a certain bias of recounting one's events when you have neurologic disease compared to not. Uh, the answer to your question about whether there's been uh, case control survey of benzo exposure, yes. Um, I, I don't know if it's been published yet, but um, the patients who were in one of the prevention trials, I think the Davunatide trial, several years ago, the drug didn't work, but it generated a lot of data on, on patients over a year of observation. Patients who progressed faster over that year were more likely to be on benz to have been on benzos. That, that's. Um, First, the main author of that will be Anne Marie Wills at Harvard. Oh, well, I, I just wanted to clarify something that Dr. Irwin said about, um, about prevention, your, your question about prevention. Um, he was talking about, and maybe you were talking about prevention starting at a pre symptomatic yeah. stage. Okay, I agree with what he said, but there have been plenty of trials and ongoing and future trials planned for secondary prevention. In other words, after the symptoms have started, can we slow down the subsequent rate of progression? And that's promising, nothing has worked yet, but that's well underway. And of course, Dr. Irwin knows that, but I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I've asked enough questions. <laughs> Those were great questions, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irwin, so much. Awesome.